Well, you know, the other day uh, I was sending a text message to somebody and I had this flashback of what it used to be like when you send text messages, right? You remember how long it used to take to like type out a text message? You had the, the, the phone with the, the nine buttons numbered one through nine and each number had letters underneath of it, like, like two was ABC and three was DEF, and so you had to punch the numbers a certain amount of times, like you were doing Morse code, in order to type out this text, and it took forever, right? You'd start typing a sentence, and then like six minutes later, you'd be done with that sentence, you'd be so proud of yourself, and you'd send it off into the interweb somewhere, and it would reach the person that you were trying to send that message to. Okay, how about this one? Do you remember the days of AOL? dial up internet remember when you had to like plug in the cord into your phone line in order to get on the internet right like you'd open up the program and it would dial this number and then you'd hear these weird alien noises right you would do that for like three minutes and then all of a sudden you would be on the internet and so you would go www.askjeeves.com and then you'd wait like three minutes and then you'd ask your question like, why is Tickle Me Elmo so popular right now? And then all of a sudden your internet would crash because why? Your mom picked up the phone to call one of her friends and you're like, oh, mom, I'm on the World Wide Web. Which by the way is where we get www, right? Things used to be so different back then. You remember when we used to have to go to these these physical stores to rent a movie, like you would actually have to drive to Blockbuster and you would have to walk into the door, you go into the new releases section and you never could really find anything there, so you go to your favorite section like the action or the comedy, the romantic comedy, whatever it was, and then you'd take your VHS and you'd walk up to the front and of course it's Friday night so there's a huge line of people that are running a movie and you'd wait in line, you'd finally get there, they'd say you have five days to return your VHS, you get into your car, you drive home, you take it and you put it in your VCR and of course the person that had it before forgot to rewind it so you rewind it all the way back to the beginning and then you watch the movie and then you take it out, you put it back in the box and then you have to drive back to Blockbuster. You get out of the car and remember they had that little drop box right next to the door and you would put it in there all the while hoping that you didn't accrue any late fees. Or friends, how about this one? You remember this thing called a map? Right, you remember you had this large piece of paper that was bigger than your car and it had like this area of, of where you live but here's the thing, you couldn't just look at it you had to know how to read it, right? You had to know things like, like north and, and south and east and west. You had to know things like, like latitude and longitude. You even had to know uh, what were the difference between county roads and state roads, interstate highways. And at the end of the day, it was up to you to determine where on the map you wanted to go and how in the world you were going to get there, all the while hoping that you didn't run into any traffic. You see, friends, a lot of the things that we did back then, the ways that we did them, are not the same ways that we do today. Okay, for example, today, it does not take six minutes to type out a text message, right? You've got the full keyboard at your disposal. You've got emojis, you've got pictures, you've got videos. You can actually speak, and your cell phone will put it into text, although make sure you check that before you actually send it, right? You know, today, we don't need AOL a dial-up internet either, right? I mean, we don't need to actually plug in a cord into our phone line. Instead, we can access the internet on our computer, our laptop, our smartphone, our tablet. We can use Wi-Fi. We can use data. And perhaps best of all, we can scroll through Facebook and we can go on all these different websites at speeds that our 1990 selves would have never even thought possible. And then, of course, today, as you know, we, we don't have to go to, to Blockbuster to return a video, right? In fact, you can't. Because there aren't any blockbusters anymore, except oddly enough, there is one still left in the world. It's in Oregon. If you ever go to Oregon, that's where you find that blockbuster. But otherwise, today, we don't even have to leave our home. In fact, we don't even have to leave our couch, right? Whether it's, it's Netflix or Hulu or Amazon Prime or Disney Plus, we can watch whatever we want, whenever we want, for as long as we want. And then, of course, today, there's, there's no need for maps, right? Right? I mean, maybe you still have one in your glove compartment, but let me ask you, when's the last time that you pulled it out of your glove compartment? Right, today we have Google Maps. You can just type in an address so you can speak it, and it'll tell you exactly how you need to get there, and it'll find the fastest route, all while accounting for, for traffic and roadblocks, and you can even change the accents 
of the person that's telling you when to turn. Or if you're like me, you can simply turn them all off because all of the accents are terrible and you just keep going with your day, right? There are so many different ways and things that we used to do back then that we do not do today. But you see, here's the thing. If you were to ask somebody, hey, why is it that the things that we used to do back then are so much faster and better and easier today? If you were to ask somebody that question, you'd probably get answers like this. Well, uh, innovation, improvements, advances in technology, all of those answers are true, but, but let, let me challenge you a little deeper here. If you were to dig a little deeper and say, yeah, but what is driving the innovation? What is driving the advances in technology? I imagine that one of the things you would likely find is a deep, tireless desire for convenience. You see, a long time ago, businesses figured out that people don't like to wait for things. Because when people have to wait, they become impatient, and when they become impatient, they also become upset and angry. You remember in Willy Wonka, Veruca Salt? Right? This is what happens when people don't get what they want when they want it. And so today, you and I, we find ourselves in a culture in which convenience is king. In other words, almost everything that we interact with today is specifically designed to be as quick and as comfortable as possible so that you don't have to wait and so that you don't have to get upset. For example, skip the line, order online. Or better yet, don't even leave your home. We'll deliver your food for you. Hey, you need an oil change? You don't even need to leave your car. You can just drive in and you'll be out of here in five minutes or less. Or how about my favorite one? You're on hold waiting for somebody to talk to a customer service representative. Are you tired of waiting on hold? Press one and we'll call you back when it's your turn in line, right? Today, we live in a culture where convenience is king, and what it's doing is it's rewiring our brains to respond negatively whenever we have to wait. And friends, the problem that arises with that is that not only does it teach us that we shouldn't have to wait for stuff, but it also teaches us that we shouldn't have to wait on people. You see, we are in week two of a sermon series that we have entitled Love What the World Needs Now. And the idea is that each week we are looking at different aspects of the biblical understanding of love so that we can better love God and better love people. Okay, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul lays out two very important aspects. He says this, love is patient and love is kind. Love is patient and love is kind. You see, friends, one of the things about our convenience culture today is that sometimes the demonstration of our love to those around us is not very patient. And sometimes because it's not very patient, it's also not very kind. For example, you say to your spouse, hey, honey, you said you were going to do the laundry. Why isn't it done yet? Or you say to your child or your grandchild, come on, why does it take you 45 minutes to eat? Just eat your food. Or you say to your coworker, you say, hey, what's the deal? You said you were going to make everything by the deadline. You know what? I'm just going to forget. I'm just going to do everything by myself from now on. I don't need your help. Or you say to the driver in front of you, hey, come on, guy. Do you know how to drive? Get off your phone and move. Right? When people don't do what we want them to do, when we want them to do it, in the way that we want them to do it, then our patience starts to run thin And when our patience runs thin, the claws come out and things get ugly. But you know what? Here's the thing. I think all of us here would agree this morning that that is not what the world needs right now. Instead, Paul's words remind us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that what the world needs now is a love that is patient and a love that is kind. And so this morning, in light of that reality, here's the question that we're going to be asking today. As Christians, how can we better demonstrate a love that is patient and kind? Okay, in other words, how might we step out of our convenience culture and into a daily practice of demonstrating love through patience and kindness? Okay, we're going to take a look at a passage today from Mark chapter 5, in which Jesus demonstrates three things that you and I can do in terms of better demonstrating patience and love in our relationships with others. And friends, as we go through these things, the hope 
is that we will be able to take these three things and be able to practice them in terms of how we embody these two values of love, patience and kindness, that Paul lays out in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Okay, so here's the, here's the first one. When it comes to better demonstrating love in, in terms of patience and kindness, the first thing we need to do is we need to slow down. All right, take a look at how this passage begins. It says, when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my daughter, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hand on her so that she will be healed and live. And so Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and she touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt her in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. And he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? <laughs> you see the people crowding against you, his disciple answered, and yet you can ask, who, who touched me? Now friends, imagine this scene for a moment. Jesus is so popular that the moment he gets out of the boat, the crowd just comes around him. And there's a synagogue leader named Jairus, and he says, hey, please come and heal my little daughter. Jesus says, okay. And so Jesus starts to walk, and this entire crowd of people is sort of crowding around him. You can imagine it's like the end of a college football game when there's a big upset, and everybody just storms the field, and the coach is like trying to make his way through. You can imagine that this is what Jesus was experiencing all the way to go see this little girl. Now, off to the side, there's this woman. And for 12 years, she had been suffering and she had been the doctor after doctor after doctor, but none of them could figure out what was going on. And to make matters worse, she lost everything she had in the process, and now she found herself out on the streets. And so you can imagine all of a sudden just hearing, if, if you're this woman, you hear what people are saying about Jesus, that, that he's the Messiah, that, that he speaks with authority, that he performs these miracles, that he heals people of their illnesses. And so in a moment of faith, that this woman, she, she stands up and she, she makes her way through the crowd. She touches Jesus' clothes. And the Bible tells us that the moment that she touched that clothes, she stopped bleeding and her suffering was gone. And Jesus, he feels this power go out from under him. And all of a sudden, he slows down and he stops and he turns around and he says, who is it that touched my clothes? And you can almost hear the audible impatience from his disciples. Like, Jesus, what's the big deal? Tons of people are touching you. We're, we're, we're all in a big crowd. Like, what do you care? We, we got to keep going. We got to keep moving. You see, in a moment when everybody was trying to hurry along, Jesus very intentionally slowed down in that moment. Friends, let me ask you, how often do we overlook people in their situation simply because we fail to slow down. You know, a couple weeks ago, uh, Graham, our youth director, put out a really great video about how sometimes when people uh, are suffering or they're hurting, we'll come alongside them and we try and say something of the variant like this, hey, it could always be worse, right? For example, somebody says, hey, I'm having a really tough time at my job, and you say, hey, at least you have a job, right? Now, you can say in that moment that you're trying to provide them from perspective, but if we're being honest with ourselves, Oftentimes, the reason we say things like that is because we don't have the time or the energy or the capacity to truly deal with their issue. And so we look at them and we think, hey, I don't have time to deal with your emotional burden right now, so I'm going to say something that hopefully comforts you, but it's also going to allow me to get out of actually having to deal with your burden, right? And so you see in that moment where it's like wrestling and wrestling. And so as Graham so aptly pointed out in that video, we don't leave people in their suffering. We meet people in their suffering. As the Bible tells us, we are called to carry each other's burdens. And it starts when we slow down in order to be able to demonstrate that love that is patient and kind. 
Okay, that's the first one. We've got to slow down. The second thing is that once we've slowed down, we've got to start to take notice of people around us. Remember, Jesus' disciples, they were trying to, to, to hurry him on. Take a look at what happened next in verse 32. It says, but Jesus kept what? Looking around to see who had done it. You see, friends, once Jesus slowed down, he stopped, he turned around, he was able to take a look around the crowd. He knew that somebody touched his robes. He knew that the power had gone from him. And now he's scanning the rows, he's scanning the people to see if he can figure out exactly who needs his help. Now, you know, back in mid-March, uh, when the parks and the playgrounds were closed, we're like, well, what are we going to do with our daughter, right? And so each evening, we started this routine where we would get the girls in the stroller and we would walk around our neighborhood. We've lived in this neighborhood now for, for about a year. And what we noticed that when we walked around this neighborhood, there were things that we saw that we had never noticed before. Okay, for example, one day we were walking around and we heard this rooster crow. And I was like, Elaine, we live in St. Pete. What in the world? Why is a rooster crowing? And sure enough, on the side of a house was this small little fenced in area with about 10 roosters and chickens, and there was a sign out front of it, small, it said, fresh eggs, $5 a dozen. Now, here's the thing. Prior to those walks, for months and months, we had driven by this house every single day, but because we were going by so quickly, we never even noticed that they had chickens and roosters, we never knew that they were selling eggs, and we definitely didn't hear a rooster crowing. And so in that moment, it was like, wow, we had slowed down. We were able to finally see it. In the same way, when we slow down from whatever it is that we're doing or wherever it is that we have to be, all of a sudden we see people in situations that we never even saw before. For example, let's say you run in the grocery store and you need to get some groceries real quick and you're, you grab the groceries, you're, you're trying to get out of there. But if you slow down for a moment, perhaps you begin to notice that the person that's bagging your groceries looks sad. And all of a sudden, you begin to realize that this isn't some robot that's just putting groceries in your bag, but it's a person with a name and a history and a future, a guy who has thoughts and concerns and feelings. And even though you don't know what's going on in his life right now, by simply noticing him, you can see that he's having a rough day. And so when he turns to you and he says, hey, would you like help out with your groceries to the car? You normally say no, right? Because you do it yourself. But you think, you know what? This guy, he, he probably just needs somebody to acknowledge him. Maybe to even to, to listen to him, possibly even to encourage him. And so, you know, I, I would normally say, no, I'm good, thank you. But today, I, I'm going to say yes. Even though I don't really need the help, I'm going to say yes and, and walk with this guy out and just talk to him. See what's going on in his life. You see, friends, when we slow down from whatever it is we're doing, wherever we have to be, all of a sudden we begin to notice people in situations that we've never noticed before. And friends, these first two things, slowing down and, and noticing those around us, are very simple yet powerful ways that we can demonstrate a love that is patient. To say, hey, I see you. I see that you're hurting. I see that you're suffering, and I'm going to take the time to be here with you in this moment. Okay, which leads us to the third thing that Jesus shows us this morning, and this is how we demonstrate a love that is kind, is that after we've slowed down, after we've, we've taken a look, we've noticed those around us, then we need to consider their needs and meet them. Remember, Jesus was looking around for who this was. Then this happened, verse 33. It says, Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Friends, when we say that love is kind, we're talking about an action. That to be kind is to consider those around us. And so when this woman came and she knelt down at Jesus' feet, what she needed in that moment was to be comforted and assured. And Jesus considered her by doing exactly that. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Now go in peace and be freed from your suffering. You see, friends, this story is just one of many instances throughout the Gospels in which Jesus demonstrated a love that is patient 
and a love that is kind. And in fact, when we look throughout the Gospels time and time again, we see that Jesus, he was never in a hurry, right? He would, he would stop and he would talk with people. He would recline with people. He would kneel down and he would pray with people. He would share meals with people. He would, he would t- hold people and embrace people. He shed tears with people. Jesus had a very important task that he needed to do, but guess what? He never lost focus on relationships. And so when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't just die, but he died for you. When Jesus was gathered around with his disciples on the night and was betrayed, what did he say? He said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Take and drink. This cup is the New Testament in my blood shed for you. You see, Jesus had a lot that he had to do to atone for our sin, and yet he never lost focus on the people around him. And so in moments like in Mark chapter 5, he had no problem slowing down and taking notice of those around him and ultimately considering their needs and meeting them. And you know what? The good news of the gospel today is that Jesus continues to patiently and kindly meet our needs with his forgiveness and his grace and his love. You know, a few years ago, there was a video that went viral of a a FedEx worker that was uh, making a delivery. Some of you have seen this video before, and what's so beautiful about it is it so, it so, so simply demonstrates what it is that we mean when we say that love is patient and love is kind. Take a look at this video. As you can tell, I'm at work. I just had to pull over and share something real quick. Um, as I'm delivering, uh, I pull up to his house. The lady walks out because she's checking her, her mailbox for her newspaper. And I have two boxes for her, so we start walking up the driveway together. And she asked me if I had a happy holidays. And I was telling her how busy it was. I told her I had a, a, a really great uh, Christmas and New Year's. And I, I asked her the same. I was like, how was your holidays? And with tears in her eyes, she said it wasn't good. And um, she said, he's sick. My husband's sick. He has cancer. I continue to small talk to try to change the subject because that's awkward. And uh, I deliver her package. She said, what's your name? I said, Amanda. And she told me her name. I drove off. Um, My heart's pounding. I I do probably 20 more stops. And I have to go back. Um, you know, with this kind of job, we're on a, a tight schedule. Um, quicker you do it, the better. The quicker you get home. I stopped what I was doing. I went back to that neighborhood and rang her doorbell and uh, asked her. She came down the stairs, and uh, she had tears in her eyes when she saw it was me. She smiled, and I said, ma'am, can I pray with you? And she just broke down. She came out on the front porch and uh, squeezed me so tight. Um, this lady I've never met. She held my hand so tight, and I prayed for her and her family and for her husband. And the point of this is, is a lot of people want the Lord to use them. And and for me as an example, I pray every day for the Lord to use me. But when he's He's trying to use you or when you feel that call and that, that tug on your heartstrings, do you move your feet? Do you move? Because I easily could have just went... I have 100 stops. I easily could have just went about the rest of my day thinking about it. So when you feel those tugs on your on your heartstrings and you feel like you need to do this, stop and do it. You know what I mean? Um, oh, man. That was like the most genuine hug I've received in a long time. And I just want to share that with you guys. If you If you're praying for the Lord to help, and to use you in people's situations, when he is giving you a chance, do it. If not, you're gonna you're gonna continue to think about it and think about it and regret it. Like, so be sure you know what you're praying for when you're praying. I don't know. I just it, it made me sad, but yet it made my day. To this lady was just so alone. But anyway, you guys have a good day. You know what I love about this young lady's story is, is number one, she, she had a really tight schedule that day, and yet she chose to slow down. 
Number two, she was delivering a package, and yet she took notice that this woman was suffering. And then number three, she could have very easily kept going, and she did for a moment, but then she turned around, and she considered this woman's needs and met her in her suffering and just prayed with her and hugged her and was with her in that moment. And friends, I think every single one of us here today would agree that more examples of that is what the world needs right now. You see, friends, my prayer for each and every one of us here today is that as we find ourselves in in a season of life where time is precious and convenience is king, may we never forget that by its very nature, love is patient and love is kind. And as followers of Jesus, we can demonstrate that love and that patience and that kindness when we take the opportunity to slow down and to notice the people around us and to consider their needs and ultimately to meet them. Amen? Amen. Please join me in a prayer. Heavenly Father, we find ourselves today in a culture where convenience is king. There's so much... Uh, that is at our fingertips. We can do whatever we want, whenever we want, wherever we want it, for as long as we want it. And yet, what happens is that sometimes when we become impatient, when we don't get what we want, we start to become upset and angry. And this doesn't just bleed over into deliveries or things we get from the store, but it bleeds over into our relationships with you. It bleeds over into our relationships with other people. And so we ask this morning that as we consider what it means to be patient and kind, that we start with the reality that you are love, that that therefore you are patient, you are kind with us, and therefore we can demonstrate that patience and kindness with others. And so, Lord, we ask today that you would help us in, in seasons of our lives where it's so easy to get wrapped up in whatever it is we're doing to slow down, to take notice of those around us, and to consider their needs and ultimately try our best to meet them. But Lord, we know that we cannot do this without you. We need your spirit who lives and dwells within us to guide us in these moments. Like the young lady in that video, she felt that prompting to go back and to spend time with that lady. Help us in our own lives to do the same. To remember that at the end of the day, while there are so many things that we need to do and things that we need to chase after, that we are called to be patient and we are called to be kind. We give thanks for your precious name by praying the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the portion of our worship service that we would usually take the offering. Uh, As always, for those of you that are worshiping in here, we have the offering plate in the back. Uh, For those of you that are worshiping online, always you can go to OurSaviorFL.org. You can also text to give. And we just want to thank you during this season for continuing to give to this ministry as we all partner together to continue to reach people with the living love message of Jesus Christ. Amen.